If, you're, uh, if you've not been with us, or perhaps just not paying attention, which sometimes I know happens in the summer, we're in a series called Hand Me Another Brick, the story of Nehemiah. It's an ancient book, and together, Nehemiah and the Old Testament, along with the book of Ezra, and actually along with the book of Esther, but Ezra and Nehemiah in the, Jew, in the original Jewish scriptures, Hebrew canon, was one book. And together with the book of Esther, those three books in your Bible tell one story. The story of how God brought his people back from exile to Jerusalem, restored them, if you will. And just to give you a little historical context, in case you've forgotten or haven't been with us, the dominant world power for over 800 years was the Assyrian Empire. Then in about uh, 800 BC, the Babylonians came and conquered Assyria. And uh, the Babylonian Empire dominated the world landscape at that time. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonian Empire marched on Jerusalem in about 550 BC, and destroyed the city, reduced the wall to rubble, burned the temple to the ground, carried off everything of value, including hundreds of thousands of Jews he took captive and took them away back to Babylon to serve as slaves, servants, or just to live in that region. And for about a century, that's how God's people, the Israelites, the Jews, existed. Scattered, a few left that were remnants, most carried off to Babylon, but nothing much left of them in terms of their worship, their culture, or their existence. And Nehemiah and Ezra and Esther tell the story of how God brought them back. It's really a remarkable story. And as I've been reading it and studying it for these sermons, I'm amazed at how relevant it is, how much it has to say to our context, even though it's an ancient story. A little review on where we are. Nehemiah hears about the condition of God's people living in Jerusalem. He is serving in the palace, the citadel of Susa, capital of Persia, because the Persian nation now has conquered Babylon, and they're running the show in the world. And Nehemiah is cupbearer to the king, Artaxerxes. This is the son of Xerxes, Xerxes the one who was the king when the Peloponnesian uh, Greek and Persian wars were going on, if you like your world history. So he's living in the palace, serving in a high position. He hears about, he's never been to Jerusalem. He's a Jew by birth and culture, but he's grown up in in exile and captivity, serving in the palace. He hears about the condition of the Jews living in that area, and it's not good news. Then four and a half to five months go by, in which time he's praying. He's seeking God. He's pouring out his heart to God about what should be done. And then... As Pastor Brian preached last week, he goes before the king. So in that four to five months of prayer, God reveals to him, it's going to be you. He stands before the king and at risk of his own life. He makes known his his sadness and sorrow over, over the people's condition. The king says to him, what do you want me to do? What is your request? And he's ready with an answer. So clearly he was praying and planning and God was putting into his heart what the plan was because he asks for things. And to the amazement of everyone, the king grants them. Now, four months of prayer, five months of prayer, seems like a long time. My guess is, if God revealed to you something specific he wanted you to do, and you knew for sure that it was God's will, you'd want to get to it. you want to do it. Four months seems like a long time to wait. But in the Bible's context, it's not really. Abraham waited 25 years for Isaac to be born. He was 75 when God said, you're going to have a son. Any 75-year-olds here this morning? If God says to you, you're going to have a son, you're probably thinking, you better pick it up, right? (laughs) 25 years go by before the baby's born. Joseph spent 10 years in Potiphar's house, two years in prison before God made him the number two position in all of Egypt. Moses spent 40 years working for his father-in-law in the wilderness as a shepherd before God brought him back to Egypt to deliver his people. Paul spent three years in Arabia before God brought him back to be his missionary to the Gentiles. So four to five months is not that long in God's economy, but I think in our culture, it feels like a long time, maybe even a waste of time. But it's not. Being used by God often means learning how to wait and to trust for God's timing. We know that Nehemiah spent those months in prayer, in planning, and we know that God was preparing him as well. I think Nehemiah spent most of those times praying. In fact, 12 times in 13 chapters in the book of Nehemiah, we see references to Nehemiah praying. Sometimes they're just one-sentence short prayers. The point is not that, 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 uh, you know, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul says we should pray without ceasing. When I was younger, I wondered, what what does that mean, pray without ceasing? Does it mean you're always walking around with your head bowed? That'd be awkward. You'd be bumping into things and people. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? It doesn't necessarily mean you're constantly praying out loud. What it means is there's no part of your life that you consider outside the need for prayer. 
Over and over again, in every situation, we see Nehemiah going to God for large and for small things. He was a man of action, no doubt. He was also a man of prayer. And those two things go together in God's view. I think in our culture, we separate them. You prayers, get busy praying. Those of us who are doers, let's do something. In God's view, it's the same thing. Those who pray and those who do are not to be separated. He didn't rush into the king's presence announcing that God had called him to Jerusalem. And even when he arrived in the city, he didn't ride into town and post a notice, meeting in one hour to disclose the plan. We're announced, I'm here. He waited. Let's read the story, picking up in chapter 2, verse 9. Chapter 2, 9, verse, through the end of the chapter, verse 20. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, and I had a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass." Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate, and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision." And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. Now, there's a tremendous amount in there, and I worked hard to reduce it down to three points. That's what pastors have, right, three points, and I couldn't do it. So we're going to have no points, which does not mean it's a pointless sermon. We're just going to walk through the text, and you can follow along as we go. I think Nehemiah's behavior here indicates that he expected some opposition, in fact, I think you could call this whole story a case study and how to face spiritual opposition, how to stay with God's work over the long haul. Uh, the journey from Persia, Susa, the citadel, where he was stationed as cupbearer to the king, to Jerusalem was nearly 800 miles as the crow flies, much longer on the roads. He's in a caravan of horses and camels, carrying wagons of, full of timber from the king's forest to build his own home and the gates of the city and so forth. He has a, a military escort. He's not riding by himself here. Scholars estimate that this journey would have taken two and a half to three months to make it from Susa to Jerusalem. Camel travels about 25 miles a day with loaded down. So they're not making great time. So four and a half months of prayer, stand before the king at risk of your life, and two and a half months on the road. And he finally arrives in Jerusalem. The phrase, beyond the river, then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river. That's the reference to the river Euphrates, which uh, was uh, separated another region or province in the Persian Empire. And so when you cross the river, you're in new territory under new Persian governors. You have to have permission to travel there. That's why he had those letters with him. That's why God was providing all he needed. He hands the letters over to the governors so that he has permission to travel on his way to Jerusalem. And then these two guys, Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite servant or official, they're going to show up over and over again in this story. These two men, we read, Nehemiah says, they are not happy that he's in town. They are not glad that he's there seeking the welfare of the people in Jerusalem. Why? What's their issue? Sanballat was governor in Samaria to the north. Tobiah was governor of the region, the Ammonite territory to the east. So they are neighbors to Jerusalem and Judea. And they're rulers in those, uh, Persian governors in those areas. So you have Zerubbabel who comes back, the first wave of returnees, who builds the temple with 40,000 Jews. That's fine. Worship all you want. 
You have Ezra, you can read about that in Ezra chapter 7 and not through 9, who comes back to read the law and teach God's word. That's fine. Worship, read the Bible, do whatever you want. But you come back to build a wall, now Jerusalem becomes a military, political, and economic threat to the surrounding regions. They're not happy about this. Build your temple, worship your God, but we don't want to see you become secure and prosperous and get in our way. We'll have more to say about those guys later. I want you to notice something. When does opposition first come for Nehemiah? He's been praying for months. Stood before the king. No opposition there. He's been on the road for two and a half months. When does it come? It doesn't come in the prayer stage or the planning stage. It comes when he takes action. I think there's a spiritual principle here. When God's people start doing God's work, actually doing things for God, we can expect that opposition will come. When we talk about it, not much to oppose. When it's all theory, not much to oppose. When it begins to happen, some people aren't happy about it. I think it's also important to notice that Nehemiah does not, at this stage, waste any time dealing with these guys. He hears that they're not happy. They're clearly voicing their displeasure. And he knows about it. But he doesn't turn aside. He doesn't try to rationalize or argue or debate with them. He goes straight on to Jerusalem. Now here's, I think, a principle for us. For Christian men and women seeking to do God's will in this world, you will face opposition, and it may come to confrontation, and it will eventually for Nehemiah. But he doesn't stop at this stage to deal with it. He has God's work to do. The principle for us is we may have to face, face a confrontation in trying to do God's will, but we're not to be out picking fights. We're not to be looking for someone, for some opposition. When it comes, we should with grace and truth face it. But here, he's like, I'm not being distracted. I've got to get to Jerusalem. I'll deal with that when the time comes. When Nehemiah arrives there, in town, military escort, wagon loads of timber from the king's forests in Persia, people would have noticed. He didn't sneak into town. There would have been a buzz about what's him arriving. Now think about this. Four to five months in prayer. Stand before the king. He gives you more than you imagined. Two and a half months on the road. You finally are in Jerusalem. What you've been praying about, planning for. What does Nehemiah do? What does he do? You know what he does? For three days, nothing. He says, I'm there three days. He does nothing. Maybe he's recovering from the journey. Then he goes out on this midnight ride. I used to love the story of the midnight ride of Paul Revere when I was a kid. My mom had this little book. and I, Anyway, that's another story. But this is kind of the midnight ride of Nehemiah. He tells nobody what God puts in his heart to do, and he goes out for this inspection of the wall to see with his own eyes what he's heard about. This, I think, it's really, it's a, really a lot of fascinating things for us here. You'll see, uh, uh, um, well, first of all, a sense of God's timing and waiting. You'll, uh, Charles Spurgeon writes this, You will often find it best to keep your own counsel, not to commit your plans to too many other people. If you want to serve God, go and do it. Let others see what you are doing and join you as they will. You have no need to talk to everyone about what you're going to do. I think he's right. Talk is cheap in God's kingdom. God's looking for men and women who will do what he's called them to do. So Nehemiah then sets out to inspect the wall by night, kind of in secret. You'll see here uh, an image of the, um, the wall in Nehemiah's day. This is uh, the, the blue outline there that's kind of narrow and thin at the bottom. That's the wall Nehemiah was going to rebuild. The larger red outline is, is the wall of Jerusalem as it exists today. So it's a much smaller version, but about four, four to four and a half miles around that blue outline. It's not a small thing he's doing. His journey is that yellow route down the bottom tip there, the southern tip of the, of, the, of the city wall. He goes out the valley gate, we're told. He heads south along the Jezreel Valley. This is, by the way, this part of the city is tucked between two valleys. Uh, it's the lowest part of the city of Jerusalem, the most vulnerable part of the city of Jerusalem. And scholars and archaeologists estimate the part that is, was in the worst condition because of the height of the wall there. So I think it's interesting that Nehemiah goes to where things are worst, where things are at their worst. He goes to the dung gate. That should tell us right there, right? He goes to the dung gate. The dung gate is not prime real estate. People are not clamoring to have their house built near the dung gate. At least I don't think so. Um, and then he goes around, around the tip. And by the water gate, the king's pool, which is sometimes called the Pool of Siloam, he could no longer go any further because the rubble was so great he couldn't ride anymore. He dismounts, walks away further, then returns back the way he came. All in the middle of the night. Why? What's going on there? What's he doing? 
I think it's important for us to notice that Nehemiah goes to where things are at their worst. He was not sightseeing. In fact, the word inspected in your English Bibles, inspected the walls, is, comes from a Hebrew word uh, that means to probe a wound. So like a doctor or a surgeon, Nehemiah is probing where things are at their worst. You see here a mock model of the city that Nehemiah would have rebuilt. That's that southern tip there around that wall. He's, he's got quite a project to do, but he goes to where things are at their worst. The Hebrew word sabar means to like probe a wound. He saw for the first time with his own eyes what he had heard about. I think if we're going to do God's work, whatever that is, internal, personal work, work in, in relational work in our families or in our, in our relational contexts, evangelistic work, serve, whatever the work is God's calling you to do, if we're going to do that, we have to be willing to face the reality, sometimes the harsh and negative reality about how things really are. Now, we all know some people who seem to only be able to see the negative. Do you know people like this? They have the spiritual gift of discouragement, the God-given ability to bring other people down, right? That's not actually a real spiritual gift, I don't think. But they just seem like that's all they can see is what's wrong, what's wrong. They're always what's wrong. There are other people who seem to have an inability to see what's wrong. They just can't face it. They don't want to see it. I never forget years ago when I was working in youth ministry, the mom who came to me with her son, and she said, my son was caught with some marijuana at his high school campus, and he got in with the wrong crowd, and he has to do community service, and he needs counseling. And since she knew some of the administrators, she got approval that he could do his service in the church and that his youth pastor could be his counselor. Would you do that for him? You have to meet six times. I said that I would. So we met a couple of times. And she said, look, he's never been involved in this before. He's just been in with the wrong crowd, and could you just help him? He, we kind of checked the box kind of thing. So we met, and it was very clear. This kid had eyes like a shark. He was spiritually kind of emotionally closed off. And it was obvious to me this was not the first time he had the wool totally pulled over his mom's eyes. This kid was headed in a very dangerous direction fast. And I tried to talk to his mom about that. She said, oh, no, no, you don't understand. Just some bad influences, just some wrong kids. He would never do that. You don't know my son. I was thinking, I don't think you know your son. And so months went by, and we didn't really get anywhere in the times we met, and this mom was, had this inability to see what was really going on, despite my efforts to help her see. And about six months later, the young man was arrested, this time by police, on school property by, for, with, with possession with intent to sell. And about a couple years after that, I heard he did some time in jail. Very sad. I wish I could tell you the story ended better than it did. But I remember this mom who would not see, would not face the real condition in her son's life. Now, I'm not saying that she could have fixed it, but I think it would have helped if she'd have seen it, if she'd have faced it. And I think that's true in our own lives, isn't it? There's stuff in your life and in my life you don't want to see, you don't want to deal with. You'd rather not pretend it's not there. <laughs> I hate weeding. I think it's the curse of sin in the garden. I hate pulling weeds. I hate it, hate it, hate it, right? <laughs> and so, but we, it needs to be done. I have this ability to pull in my driveway and not see the weeds that are growing to like neck high. In our, in our, my wife doesn't have that spiritual ability. I can just ignore it. I can just wall it off, you know? It's not there. La, 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 no weeds. Go inside. Pretend they're not there. <laughs> Spiritually speaking, we do this, don't we? There's areas of our life that other people see. Other people know we're out of control. Other people know are dangerous or off. We don't want to face it. I think one of the things that this story tells us is that Nehemiah, when he gets there, it'd be easy to get started right away, to go where things are at their best. He goes right to the most desperate situation, right to where things are broken the worst, to see with his own eyes what this is going to be. I wonder if in that midnight ride, if he thought, what have I got myself into? I've never built a wall before. I'm not sure I can handle this. But he draws strength from what he's already seen God do what he knows that God has called him to do. Now, what if somebody could take a tour around your heart like Nehemiah did around the wall? What if someone could walk, spiritually speaking, around your life and point out all the broken places? What if I had a magic pastor's remote control that I could click and on the screen would show all of the, the juiciest and shadiest thoughts you've had since, say, breakfast yesterday? If I could, we could write down the row. You first, click right there. We could write down the row. And I could, which of you wouldn't squirm? By, by the way, they don't exist. They don't make those passes remotes. I don't have one. We're not doing that. <laughs> There's stuff we don't want to see. But if God is going to do his work in us, we have to face it. We have to learn to face it. And I think Nehemiah, who's going to help the Jews face it, we need people like that in our own life who will say, look, look, this is not good. God is not happy with this. He wants better for you. He wants to remake this whatever it is. 
Proverbs 25, 28 says, a man without self-control, like it's like a city broken into and left without walls. I think as much as anything, Nehemiah was counting the cost here before he continues. In Luke 14, Jesus tells a story about taking up our cross and following him. The disciples say, this is a hard teaching. And Jesus says, someone who doesn't count the cost is like someone who goes to build a tower without counting the cost of the work, without even knowing what it's going to take, what you're going to need. Discipleship, there's a cost involved. There's, there's a price we pay to follow Jesus. Now, it doesn't even compare to what he gives us, the blessings and the joy. But even Jesus says, you should take, take stock of what's being asked of you here. Verses, so up to this point, up to verse 16, he said nothing about what he's going to do. He's not gone public at all. I think partly he's just really shrewd. He's probably letting the buzz build, the anticipation build. People are talking. Then in verse 17, he finally makes it known what his plan is. Verse 17, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. What do you notice about that verse? We and us. Nehemiah does not run in town and say, you people have a problem and I'm here to help you fix it. He is not separating himself from them. He's never lived in Jerusalem. By all, by all accounts, he's never been to Jerusalem. Yet he says, we have an issue. You see what our condition is. Let us do something about it. He's right with them. This goes back to his prayer in chapter 1 when he identifies himself with the people's sin and condition. He's one of them. If you're going to do God's work in serving other people, we don't do that standing at a distance, saying, let me give you some money. Let me help you out from a distance. Let me help you with your problem. We identify ourselves with the people in need. In a sense, we become one of them. Isn't that what Christ does in the incarnation? He doesn't stand at a distance and say, let me, let me tell you how to get yourself saved from up here. He condescends. He becomes one. He becomes, takes on flesh. That's what Nehemiah does here. He identifies with them. Now, here's interesting, something interesting. Jerusalem has been in this condition for a hundred years. For a century, the walls have been in, 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 broken down. What happens when there's a broken part of someone's life and it stays that way for year after year after year after decade after decade? What happens to people? Do they become more motivated to change, more dissatisfied, more, in, more discontent with the way things are? Not usually. The longer it goes unattended, what happens? We sort of settle in. This is just the way it is. We have a weedy front yard. Oh, well, this is the way things are. We, we become complacent. We accept that this is just the way it is for me or for other people, right? Wouldn't you think the longer somebody's in church around God's people, around God's word, around the worship of God, they would become more loving and generous and kind and patient and peaceful and truthful? Wouldn't you think that would happen? Is that always the way it is for church people? Some of you should be going like this. You just, some of you are going like this. Right, right? No, sadly it's not. Let me, let me tell you something. It might be okay with us or with you to just let, oh, that's just the way Pete is. You know, he's just, he's just ornery. He's just negative. Forgive this to any Pete's here this morning. I'm not talking about you personally. I don't think it's okay with God. It is not okay with God to have broken parts of our lives, relationships in our hearts. He's not satisfied with that. He doesn't become complacent and say, well, that's just the way Jeff is. He wants better for you and for us. Nehemiah is facing a people who have sort of settled into this is the way it is. You know, I guess we deserve it. I guess it's just part of, you know, God's judgment. I guess we just live this way with broken walls. How does Nehemiah motivate him to do, for the first time they're ready to do something about it, how does he do it? This is my favorite part of this story, verse 18. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthen their hands for the good work. It's just one verse, one sentence. You can miss this. What motivates the people after a hundred years of just, this is the way it is? What changes them? What motivates them to do something about it? Nehemiah does what? He doesn't say, here's my plan. He doesn't say, let me tell you my brilliant insights. Let me, let me share with you my leadership skill and my, my, my strategic plan. What does he do? He tells the story of what God has done. You see that? He says, then I told them about the hand of my God and about what the king said. What a story he had to tell. 
Let me tell you about what God did in my heart. Let me tell you about how God changed the heart of a king. He tells the story about what God has done. And what happens? The people say, let's do this. Let's do this. We can do this. Friends, I think this shows us the power of a story. What motivates people? You ought to, you have to, the five principles, the ten truths, the six things you should do, the five rules. No. They have their place. What motivates people is the story of God. The story of what God has done and is doing and will do. That motivates us. And we have the greatest story to tell. It's the story of the gospel, of what God has done. The people say, let's rise up. Let's, let's build. We can do it. With God's help. If, if God can change the heart of a king, he can do this. Now they have a vision for what God is doing. And, and then it, Nehemiah says to them in, in verse 17 again, he says that we know, may no longer suffer derision. That word there sometimes translated reproach or shame. It's referring back to chapter 1, verse 9, when Nehemiah prays, we'll go back to the place where you will make your name dwell. Nehemiah is saying to them, this is not just about the stones, not just about the bricks and the mortar. It's not about the wall. It's about the glory of God in this place and in your lives. That's what God is coming to restore. That's what you've lost sight of. That's what you've given up on. And that's what God wants to bring back. Not just a wall. It's not a political endeavor here. It's not a military operation here. It's a spiritual building. That has, it manifests itself in this physical wall in this time in history. But what God is doing is restoring his glory in his people. And by the way, that kind of wall building is still going on in the church today. And I'm not talking just about the hole in the ground out there. I'm talking about your heart, our life as God's church. God wants to bring his glory and his power and his presence and his purpose to his people in the world. Then it was the wall around Jerusalem. Today, it's the church in the world. So let's not stop telling the story about what God has done. Last, Nehemiah addresses Sambalot and Tobiah. We'll finish here with this. He addresses these guys, and they're going to come up again and again here in the story. Finally, they stand up and they mock and they jeer. Now you might think, well, what's so what? What's a little, what's a little verbal mock mockery now and then? They're not teasing the people, but they're, they're mocking God. And that Nehemiah can't stand for. Notice what they say in verse 19. They say, what is this thing you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? First of all, they don't even know what they're talking about. And that's a lesson for us right there. When you feel opposition from outside and from your own heart, often that voice has no idea what it's even talking about. Because these, these Sambalot and Tobiah don't even know that Nehemiah has letters from the king's own hand, permission to be there. They don't know what they're talking about. And Nehemiah finally faces them. He says to them, the God of heaven will give us success, for we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no share, no part, no portion, no right in Jerusalem. Now that's interesting. We think of Sambalot and Tobiah as outsiders. But if you go to Nehemiah 13, we won't go there now, but in Nehemiah 13, we'll talk about that in weeks to come, you can read that, that Sambalot was married into the priestly family of Jerusalem. Tobiah was in the priestly clan by birth. These guys are Jews by birth and by marriage. They're insiders, not outsiders. They ought to be for what God is doing, but they're against it because they've lost, they've lost touch with what God is doing. They're not spiritually part of God's family, but by birth and marriage they are. Here's what I want to say to you. Sometimes we hear the voice of Sanballat and Tobiah outside of us. When God's people want to do God's will in their life, sometimes you have opposition from outside of you. People at work, People in your neighborhood, people in your own family. I'll never forget the guy who used to come when I worked in a different church. He was a multimillionaire and he gave away 80% of his income uh, to, to different uh, uh, efforts of kingdom building and God's ministries. And he would come to our senior pastor and say often, you got to tell me I'm not crazy. I'd say, what? He said, look, my accountants think I'm crazy. My business partners think I'm crazy. My friends think I'm crazy. They are not believers. Every now and then, tell me a story of how someone's life was changed and remind me that I'm not crazy for giving all my money away. I need to be reminded that I'm not crazy. He has voices of opposition in his life. He needs someone to tell him a story and remind him that it's worth it. Sometimes those voices come from outside. But this story shows us that also there are times when the voice of Sambalot and Tobiah come from the inside, don't they? You have a Sambalot 
and a Tobiah in your own heart. I do too. You know what mine says to me sometimes? Sometimes that voice says to me, Jeff, if those people knew what you're like, what you really like, they wouldn't listen to you. Which is probably true. So I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> God says to me, and the voice of truth says to me, I know what you're like, but you're talking about me, not you. So keep talking. Sometimes the voice comes from inside. Who do you think you are? Who are you kidding? You're playing a game here. God can't keep forgiving you for that. This issue's been with you so long, you're a failure. But Nehemiah shows us how to respond to that voice and those voices. He says, the God of heaven will give us success. If you know in your heart God has called you to do something, let me be specific with you as we close. Some of you, you know in your heart there's a relationship that is broken, like a broken wall, and you're not dealing with it. And God is saying to you, deal with that. I want you to deal with that. Some of you in your life, you know that God is calling you to do something. You've been on the sidelines, and you're not involved in any, in any service at all, and you know God is stirring you to get involved. But your life is kind of full with your own stuff, and you think, I don't have time. God is saying, deal with that. I want you to get involved in my service. Some of you, in your own heart, you've got stuff in your life that is, that's pulling you down. Sin that's entangling you, and you're not facing it. Whatever your thing is, God, if you know God is calling you to, to do something, to deal with something, let me ask you this. What's standing in your way? What voice, what person, what obstacle is in your way really? What's stopping you that you can't say to spiritually or audibly? The God of heaven will give me success. So get out of my way. Because you have no part here. That's what God wants for us. To rebake us, to rebuild us in his image and for his glory. Let's pray. God, we thank and worship you for this amazing ancient story which speaks so powerfully to us today. We thank you that you're still rebuilding walls in our hearts, in our lives. God, forgive us for being complacent for accepting the way things are. Give us a vision for what you're going to do by telling the story of what you have done. We praise you, Jesus, in your name and for your sake. Amen.